we're CIPD Central London. We're one of seven London branches run by volunteers like me um, and Danny as well. And we, um, for CIPD Central London, um, you can find events that we run on Eventbrite. Um, we've got, we're running an OD series this year. So the next event we've got coming up is organization design. And we've got some great guests on there and that's at 14th of March. Um, and we're also running our final OD session of the year, which is leading change without the chaos, if that is possible. <laughs> so that's getting a lot of interest. And we also do things like freelancer and independent consultant sessions. Uh, we're really passionate about diversity and inclusion, and it's all about wellbeing and HR skills as well. So, so you're really, really welcome. Whatever your interests are, it's generally an event that we like to run for you. Um, so just a little bit about the CIPD team that are jo uh, today. Um, so it's me and Danny. So Danny is actually not actually a, a CIPD volunteer. She's, she's an honorary one tonight. She's stepping in to help us um, just because we've got so many people attending tonight. Um, Danny, do you just want to say hi and just a little bit about yourself? Hi, everyone. So um, I'm Danny, Garand, business partner by day. I've done OD from an internal perspective when I was director of people, um, investors in people. So a lot of my role there was organisation development, but I now practice as an external OD practitioners so I'm really looking forward to hearing from all the all the speakers. Yeah, we've got some really good speakers. Really excited about this. Um, my, my name's Garen. Um, I'm, I'm also a uh, OD consultant, have been, oh my God, for nearly two decades. Oh, wow. <laughs> so um, I think sometimes, and just a little bit about my OD experience. So I've got a master's in OD. Um, I'm also chair of the CIPD London Organisation Development Group as well. Just we're really passionate about OD. Um, if we think OD hasn't had enough attention for so long, and it's really important that it gets the attention and as many many people access and aware of it as possible. So we're all trying to promote that as much as possible. Um, if you do want to track us, we're always putting OD videos out, Danny, aren't we? Um, so it's sort of tips and tricks. We've got some OD videos, HR skills and all that kind of thing for or OD skills for HR professionals um, too. So let's over to today's session. So we've got, as I said, we've got some really brilliant guests because no two journeys into OD are the same. So um, our, one of our guests tonight is, um, is Shauna and she's Deputy Director um, of Organisation Design and Culture for HMRC. So Shauna, do you want to just say hi and just a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, hi, thanks, Garen. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, as Garen's explained, I'm a Deputy Director for an internal organisation design and development function in civil service. Um, I've worked in civil service for about five years, but have generally practiced um, across uh, public sector, so local government and NHS. Um, and my background is an occupational psychologist. That's how I fell into OD and D. So more about that later. Brilliant. And, and, and so many people find themselves falling into OD or OD finds them as well. That will be a theme that is concurrent throughout the night. Um, brilliant. Uh, our next guest um, is the brilliant Anne-Marie Barlow um, and she's director at Energised Development. So Anne-Marie, if you want to just introduce yourself, that would be great. Yes. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. So um, similarly to Sean, my background is local government, so public sector. Um, and I think it's about three years ago, I moved into um, the outside world and started my own business. Um, and I can talk more about that later. So yes, I practice as an external consultant now. Brilliant. And it's such an interesting journey, um, Anne-Marie's transition into that. And I think you'll find it intensely useful. Mm -hmm. um, and last but very much not least, in fact, the person who's going first tonight is Alexis. Um, and he's senior OD specialist. Uh, you describe it as the largest organisation you've never heard of. Is that right, Alexis? That's 100% right, Karen. Yeah. And uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah. So my name's Alexis, senior OD specialist for uh, the UK and Europe for the Bechtel Corporation, Bechtel Limited here in the UK. Um, I've been working in the, I've been working in the industry for about a decade in a number of countries, but I'll talk a bit more about that later. And really grateful to be here, and uh, yeah, hopefully it's helpful. Fantastic. And Alexis has a background in anthropology, which is intensely useful in OT. <laughs> we'll hear more about that later as well. So we've got a really interesting panel. Each one of them bring their own unique journey and are doing something, um, you know, very different from each other as well. So um, just a little bit of the running order tonight. So um, for those of you that are actually new to OD, we're going to just do a little bit of a 10 minute introduction to what is OD. Um, and so hopefully that just give you a little bit of context. Um, we're going to start with Alexis, who is an inter what we describe as an internal consultant in OD. 
Um, then we'll work uh, with Sean, who's uh, in organization design. Um, and then finally, we'll be with Anne-Marie, who's an external OD consultant. So we'll be doing um, a bit of a session with all of them. And as we go through it, we really, really invite your questions. No question too small. Be greedy. Ask the questions that you want um, and really want to try and work through as many as possible. So we really want to get the chat box moving tonight. And if you do ask questions, um, Sean, Anne-Marie, Alexis will be constantly in the chat box tonight and answering the questions that they can as we go through it. So um, what we want to do is just to understand a little bit about who's in the room tonight. So uh, we're just going to do a quick poll um, just to help um, our guests tonight. So we've just put the poll up there. So where are you in your organisation development and design career? Are you an HR professional looking to move into od and Are you an HR professional with some OD responsibilities? Um, are you a student and you're exploring OD as a career right now? Are you a consultant looking to gain OD experience? Um, and we couldn't catch every category because we only had five. Um, the other one is please, other, please comment in the chat. So if you just want to just uh, complete the poll, and what we'll do is we'll close the poll when we hit about 70%, if that's okay. And I'll just share those results. So we've got a, an absolute even split between HR professionals looking to move into OD and HR professionals with some OD responsibilities, which is great. So that's um, some people, some, some opportunity there potentially to really expand their OD experience. 14% um, of you are students and you're really welcome. Um, you really are. Um, consultants, we've got 13% and we've got others. Please comment in the chat below. So uh, for example, we've got an operations manager looking to move in um, to a more people focused role. Um, and uh, another person who's a non HR professional who's looking for more experience brilliant well i hope you find something of value tonight um, and we again please ask your questions as we go through it great so i'm going to give you a very controversial presentation for the next 10 minutes because there's one thing that od people could agree on is that they don't agree on od and what it is so we're going to give you very a very simple definition from our perspective but we always encourage you to talk to lots of different OD practitioners because everybody does it differently. Everyone has their own experience and background. Um, OD is a very broad church and lots of different backgrounds. And we'll try and explain a little bit of that now. Um, and I, I thoroughly expect Shauna and Anne-Marie and Alexis to challenge me on this definition as well as we go through it. So um, we're, we're really pleased because there's so many different journeys into OD. Um, we've actually invited and reached out to the OD community and we've got some brilliant people who have also submitted either video videos or written submissions about their journey. And we've asked them four similar questions to what we've, we're have we going to ask Sean, Anne-Marie and Alexis tonight. And there's some really rich insights. So we've got like Liz from the House of Commons. Uh, we've got um, Gwen Sterling Wilkie, who specialise in hybrid working. Um, we've got Kelly Angus, who's very senior in the NHS and working on some really big change projects. And we've got like Hamali, um, who's an OD advisor. So we've got a real branch of experience. So if you click on this QR code, you will get a copy of the slides if you've registered for tonight. OK, um, and if you scan that code, that'll take you straight through to just somewhere where we're hosting at the moment and this will continue to build to so keep going back to it um, and then eventually we'll, we'll probably rehouse it somewhere uh, more permanent but we just wanted to get uh, lots of different experiences and we've also got the brilliant Karen Domain on there as well who's uh, a real rock star um, in the NHS OD world as well. So what is organisation development? Let's get controversial. Um, so a little bit about this, some really interesting research recently by uh, Bendel in 2022, and he found basically there are 500 different job descriptions for OD. There are 40 different operational definitions of OD. There are 31 different competency publications for you to read. And there's 11 competency frameworks. So you'll see that like Sean and I are both sort of fellows of the CIPD. And I think Alexis is going through it at the moment, aren't you? So um, we're basically, we follow the CIPD profession map and you basically have to evidence against that. But there's lots of other standards of which guide your um, professional development as well. Um, and there's also 144 different undergraduate programs as well. Um, major consulting firms are really into change management. Um, and they're very big in that field. IT consultants have also kind of encroached into OD territory, particularly around sort of digital transformation and then new ways of working like design thinking are quite similar to OD. And also like when people contact us to have some work with me and Danny, they never ask for OD, do they, Danny? No. <laughs> They say, I've got a problem or the sky's on fire or something like that. And can you come and help me? They never ask for OD. So what that means is when you're actually typing into Indeed or wherever you're typing it, you may not find the OD jobs presenting themselves. They're often something else. So you have to do a bit of investigative work. Um, the other thing to think about as well is a lot of OD roles are actually hybrid. 
Um, so as you can see, there's a whole list of things that the research found. So, you know, VP of DE&I and organizational effectiveness. So it's, it's two roles, but often even the first role is actually done in an OD way. So it just means that there's a lot more OD roles than there were originally, but you just have to do lots of research and speak to lots of people as well. But it can feel a bit overwhelming knowing where to begin. So as I said, there's kind of 40 definitions of OD and we said we promised we'd give you some of ours. So our definition is that it's about improving organization effectiveness in the service of achieving organization goals. So you've got your as is and you've got your to be states where you want to be. And OD is about helping you build the capabilities that you need and sometimes helping them develop the, st the strategy that they're trying to work on as well. And it's really about making sure that like structure, culture and strategy are all aligned, but really realistic about the actual operational realities. And it's also making sure that across the organization, there's collaboration and cooperation because the research just shows that this produces better results in organization. And also by high levels of satisfaction and commitment, that also has a very hard outcome. Um, and this is where OD and, and design focuses a lot of its attention. Um, our view of OD is it's scientific, so it's underpinned by a lot of behavioural science uh, and those practices are used to facilitate the change. It's systemic, so we see the organisation as a whole. We don't do discrete pieces of work. We understand that if we move this thing here, it will make this thing rattle over there. So we have to take a, an overarching look at the organisation. It's absolutely humanistic, people are at the heart of everything, and it's all about helping people realise their full potential. And it's intensely participative and inclusive. There's often a belief that with OD, the answer is in the system. It's just we've got to find it. And it's often with marginalized voices. So it's about making sure that decision making processes are participative, inclusive. And the other thing as well is that OD is sustainable. So we equip people to fix their problems long term. Um, and OD should only really be temporary scaffolding. We need to be in and out. Um, and then, then we can go and focus on better things and they can then um, be sustainable as well. Um, it's all about systems. Danny found this brilliant quote by Kurt Lewin, the father of OD. If you really want to understand something, try to change it. <laughs> I'm sure uh, uh, Anne-Marie, Shauna and Alexis will have an experience of what happens when you try and change something. Uh, all sorts of unusual things start to happen. So you really need to understand the system. So it's really important that you do research when you do the work. Some of the foundations of OD um, that are really important thing is we described it as a bit as the magpie profession. So, you know, Shauna's background is in um, occupational psychology and Alexa's in anthropology. You know, we all have different backgrounds and all of that is very useful for what we do. So, you know, sociology is intensely useful. Um, social psychology, systems theory, anthropology, uh, management theory, complexity theory, biology, cybernetics. There's a, an even more. And that means that often people describe it as a calling because there's just a lifetime's worth of learning and, um, and you can apply all these wonderful theories in the, in the service of helping an organization. Um, if you want to do a little bit of reading into it, there's some brilliant thinkers. We've mentioned Kurt Lewin, uh, Wilfred Beyond did brilliant work, intensely interesting on um, group dynamics. Um, Douglas McGregor, X and Y and Power, um, Edgar Schein or Edgar Sheen on culture and consulting, Maslow you would have heard of, Chris Argris and double loop learning, and some of the more recent thinkers, Mian Chung Judge, um, recently unfortunately passed away, uh, but has left a huge legacy, um, and if you get a chance to go to the Quality and Equality YouTube site, she's collated some of the best thinkers, um, a brilliant collection there for you to check out, and we love, uh, Danny, we're big fans of Gervais Bush, Bush. Um, uh, Barry Osher, we quite like, um, and I know that Shauna is, uh, for those of you into organisation design, uh, Naomi Stanford as well, who's a prolific author and a brilliant speaker on OD, uh, org design, and, uh, and some, a real rich source of, um, of insight. Um, most OD practitioners will have a copy of this on their Kindle, their bookshelf, some edition. Um, and so things like social constructionism, that really, for me, was a breakthrough moment. Once I understood social constructionism, then things made sense. So it's a really nice book to get you started. And we, we believe that everyone should have an OD mindset, whether you're an HR practitioner, whether you're a manager, whether you're internal, external, if everybody had an OD mindset, then organizations would really flow. We'd actually see beyond ourselves when we're working and really integrate the work that we do and help organizations perform better. So what does it look like in practice? And how do you know when you do it? Well, it can help leadership and management and help with conflict, help an organization uh, develop and, and, and work to its values. You can use it to help develop a strategy or to assess and improve a culture. You can use it for change. You can use it for your performance management systems. You can help organizations prepare for whatever the future brings us. 
Um, you can do some of the hard OD elements, which is all good design and the process behind it. And OD can really help um, as we make the transition for the biggest social experiment on earth, which is the switch to hybrid working as well. Um, how do we do it? Well, it's probably best to think of like an analogy of a golf set. You have a different club for a different shot. Um, sometimes you need a putter, so you'll be doing coaching. Sometimes you need a, 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 um, a an iron because you've got to hit a fair distance. So it might be just working with teams or doing some consulting. And sometimes you've just got to use the wood and you've got to hit it a long way. Um, so you'll do a large group intervention. That's where you just get everybody in the system together because that and everyone has to engage in the change as well. Um, and we also use lots of theories to make sense of what's going on around us. So um, I'm sure everyone has their own favorite theories. Uh, but what we do is because we only see partially, um, we have to we use um, theories and, and processes to, or sorry, um, theories to, to, and frameworks to make sense of what's going on. So it's really good to be well read on OD. Um, and some of these theories can really help you make sense of it. So things like polarity management, it can really help you understand what's going on in conflict, for example. And then also the big thing about OD is that we intervene at multiple levels at any one time. Um, it's very easy to get involved in whack-a-mole because we're trying to identify problems and, and often things are presented as symptoms. So they'll say, I don't know, we've got high levels of absence. So you fix that and it looks really good for two quarters, then it pops back up again because often it's like below the surface. So OD is all about making sure we, we look deep into the organization and we not just intervene at an individual level, even if our client is telling us to do it, we intervene at different levels as well to make sure the change sticks. Um, and we also have to um, you know, give feedback to our clients as well. And sometimes that their hypotheses are wrong um, and we have to sort of feedback and, and give them some quite honest feedback as well. So that is probably um, the most abridged version of OD you'll ever have in your entire life. And it's probably created many more questions than it's actually answered. Uh, but we just wanted to give you a little bit of a jumping off point. Um, it, that could probably be a, a two year course, but we've just given you 10 minutes. Okay. So what next? As I said, just dig into the OD career resources that we talked about. Um, and that hopefully will be really useful for you. And just do lots of reading into OD as well. And we'll, we'll signpost and give you advice throughout the session as well move to Alexis if that's okay. Sure. Um, so great. So Alexis, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Danny's got to be managing uh, the chat box. So if you guys have questions, we'll hopefully have time for it as well. So we're going to chat to Alexis for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so I guess Alexis, can you just for everyone in the room tonight, can you just explain a little bit about your role, please? Sure thing, Garen, yeah. So I do so I, the way my organization is structured, I fall into what they call the talent management people operation team. Please don't ask, like, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But essentially, for UK and Europe, I do everything that is OD related for Europe and UK for, um, I'm trying to think how many employees we've got in the region. I think we've got about 2,000 out of about 15,000 globally. So the organization I work for is a, an American-based, what they call EPC, Engineering Project Management Construction Management. So they're very much in that construction engineering space. Um, what I do, so, so <laughs> it's, it's a difficult one to really put into to, to nuts and bolts, but essentially you can think of me as like the internal consultant. So the more traditional thing would be an external consultant coming in, hearing the issue, proposing something, and making something happen, I just do that as more of an internal reason. So that's very, very quickly what I do in, in the very, very basic terms. I, I mean, I could try and go into, I, don't, I, I could kill 15 minutes just trying to explain the whole process because we're, we're, we're still, we're actually going through a process right now of trying to define, well, what does OD mean in the different regions? You know, because we've got, we've got a global We've got quite a global reach. Um, we've delivered, our organization has delivered over 25,000 projects over the 125 years that our company has been around. Okay, great. So well, just to, to give an example then, what, what would be a piece of what you're really proud of that you've done in there? Um, geez, I can't just pick one, but I, but I think the one that most recently I was really proud of was during COVID. Um, we had a project that was launched in Serbia uh, we 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 we're working on developing a lithium mine there, and they we were very grateful that we have a client there 
who's really keen on OD and, and, and this kind of work. So they were more than happy to, yeah, no, let's do it, bring them on. So I, I was shipped over to Serbia for a couple of days and I did a two-day team alignment with the senior leadership team, brought them together, tried to, you know, trying to get them, you know, aligned in, in their thinking. In our organization, so you just spoke about team intervention in the great summary of OD there, our organization calls that team aligned, generally speaking. So making sure everyone's on the same page, we're agreement, you know, we get all the, you know, we, we air the dirty laundry, we make it clear that, you know, yes, this is what I'm, this is what bugs me, this is what bugs you, how can we get over it, move forward type thing. So, yeah, that, that was one I'm pretty proud of. But, but surely managers should be able to do that themselves. These are all intelligent, educated people, professionals, like surely they can do that themselves. Why do they need you to go and fly to Serbia for two days to do that? I wish, I wish it was that straightforward. It's actually amazing when I explain what I do, so many people will say, well, actually, I kind of do that anyway. You know, I, I kind of do that. You know, if you, if, you know, I, I manage, I manage a team of 50, you know, I deal with people issues all the time. I, you know, I have to manage conflict. I have to do a little bit of coaching. I have to do a little bit of these things. I do these, I do some of your stuff anyway, but, which is really true. But I think, I think the biggest benefit of having an OD resource in some form or another, internal, external, or otherwise, is that it actually shows, we're, we're almost the mirror for the organization to make them aware that, well, hang on, I've been doing this OD thing already, I just didn't call it that. You know, so I think it's, you know, you could you could argue why they need an OD resource, why do why do people need mirrors? Because you need to be able to look yourself in the face and see what's, what's going on, if that really? metaphor makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. So, and and the questions are starting to come into the chat as well. So, which is brilliant. Yeah. So, guys, please keep it coming. That's that's really good. Um, and we'll we'll go back into some examples. But I guess how, how did you actually get into OD? Because um, you haven't just worked at your organization now. What has been your sort of uh, your journey so far? My, yeah, my journey. So, the accent might give it away for some of you. If it doesn't, it's okay. So, I'm actually from South Africa originally, um, and in South Africa. OD is a very immature, it's in an immature status at the moment. It's got great potential. It's definitely going to become really big there. And I, I look forward to the day where we could do sessions like this with South Africa. Um, and it's, it's, it's part of the course. It's not quite there yet, but we'll, we'll get there. But yeah, so I'll go a step back even further. So I'm from South Africa originally. I, I'm obsessed with culture. Uh, I did so. I came across social anthropology or cultural anthropology, depending on which part of the world you're in. Um, I was obsessed with culture, and I I I did my undergraduates in South Africa. I did my masters in the U.S., and I had this uh, I had this uh, dream of actually doing a doctorate at LSE. I love that happened. You happened to go yesterday to LSE, Garen. I'm jealous. Um, but I, I knew that you know there was there was an opportunity for anthropology to have benefits in the workplace, in the real world, you know, because historically anthropology was all about going out into the wild, going, you know, the pith helmets in, in, in the, the vast regions of the Amazon, something exotic. But there was anthropological application in the real world, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I spent uh, an inordinate amount of time trying to, to make that a thing. Oh, corporate culture consultant, that's going to be a thing. Only to find out that there is something that already does that called OD. So I decided I, it made sense to, well, you know, if OD is already doing it, let me find out more about what that is. So I started working for an organization in South Africa. Um, it was a management consultancy focused on, on organizational development exclusively. Mm -hmm. There was a training there that I was able to do that gave me a high certificate in OD. And I, at the time, I, I wasn't getting... I, I, it gave me a good foundations and understanding of what is OD, what are some of the, the tools and techniques out there. Um, eventually, I left that organization and I recognized that um, if I'm going to go off and be a practitioner, I need to get out there. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do it in South Africa. I'm not going to go into the politics there. For those who may know, who may understand that, they'll understand why. But essentially, I, I have a Greek passport, which is why my name is so long. And uh, at the time, I was like, okay, well, I can go to the UK. I've got a Greek passport. And I I moved over here just before Brexit. So 
timing was good. I actually started off in the UK doing um, uh, doing my uh, working for the NHS in Leicestershire. So I was very and was very proud of that, and and, and really was a really good use of, of of getting me into the field and seeing how they do it in the UK. And what was your first role? Sorry, what was your first role? I was an ODF. Yeah. Fac- I was an OD facilitator. So that was what? my official title. Brilliant. So that's like a, sort of a, a, a stepping stone for you. And what does an OD facilitator do that's different to what you're doing at the moment? Ah, uh, not not too much difference. Essentially, you could, I guess, and I guess you could think of that. What we, so I guess, so my title now is called senior OD specialist. And by the by, I've never heard of a junior OD specialist, so I don't know why there's such a role. It should just be OD specialist. But anyways, I guess an OD facilitator, to use the language in the NHS context, and I don't know if that role still exists, but I would call that essentially a junior OD specialist. There, it's newer to the field. You you're doing more of the facilitator aspects of it, a lot more orientations. You know, get, getting getting your teeth sunk in. Um, I worked in the NHS for about three years, roughly. I then tried to pivot because I found as well that. I needed to get more sec. I, I needed to get a broader view because I, I I worry that if I only work in one sector and one way of working, my my practice is going to become stale. So I tried to pivot into that IT change management space, as you you mentioned. That's something that IT consultants do. Um, didn't quite work for me, but I ended up coming across this opportunity with Bechtel, and uh, that's been three and a bit years, and has been. An amazing three years, giving me exposure to different projects all over the world, giving me, yeah, just 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 helping me grow amazingly. Brilliant, so so interesting. And you've touched on some of the courses that you studied. Obviously, you've done an OD certificate. What, what are you currently doing to keep your sort of professional development up to date? Like, what kind of things do you do? What what sources of information do you go to? Um. So, I recently completed a, a formal coaching apprenticeship. Uh, so if you're in an organization that's got you the apprenticeship levy, I would de- and if you are interested in OD, I would strongly recommend you look into the level five coaching apprenticeship because it's it's a, it's a great way of giving you the foundations of coaching, which is a really useful tool for, for any OD practice. Um, so, so that was one I finished recently, finished that end of last year. I literally just yesterday handed in my experience assessment for the MCI PD, so the member charter of one. So fingers crossed that goes well when I do my um, when I do my interview in in a cup in a few months time or so. But yeah, so I I, I I constantly look for for opportunities to learn, and it doesn't have to be formal learning either. I mean, using things like uh, social media, you get access to a lot of different tools that are out there, a lot of books. Uh, I mean, you you know, you showed. Uh, Yang's the uh, seminal piece with Linda as well. You know the 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 OD the HR the HR guide to OD. Uh, I mean, if I look here, I've got a couple of books on system theory. You know Etienne Wenger on communities of practice. There are so many books out there that you can expose yourself to. But brilliant. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's one way of doing it. But I think just look for those opportunities. Great. And and if we go sort of into the role that you've got at the moment, um, mm-hmm. we, we just want to ask, like, what do you enjoy most about your role? And, and what do you find most challenging? Oh. So what I love most about my role is, is, is working with, working with the, the so, you know, the, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the 4P model. So you've got, you know, you've got the participants, the people who are fully engaged and want to be there. You've got the passengers who basically like, yeah, they're happy to be there, but they want to be very passive. So they're happy to sit back and let everyone else do the work. Then you've got the uh, you've got the prisoners who basically are there under duress and basically who I was told to be here. And then you've got the protests who are the people that are who are loud and and and, and actively trying to like they 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 they're against this, but they're 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 engaged. And what I love seeing is those protesters become participants because as soon as they, they get the click and they see, ah, this is what this guy is here to do. He's not just here to, you know, to stand in front of us and make noise. You know, he's here to try and help us, you know, achieve what we're trying to do. And, ah, it makes sense. This is what I'm trying to do. And it's, and seeing those, 
seen those aha moments are really what it's about. But my my all time favorite thing is T G I M. And if anyone's wondering, that stands for Thank God It's Monday. So it's basically getting people engaged and loving the work they do. And that's a big part of your work, is it? Ah, uh, it's a lot. Well, I wouldn't say it's a big part of my work. It's a part. It's, it's certainly the, the 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 driver for me. It's my motivation. It's what it's what makes me. Um, it's it's just what it's what gives me my drive. But a lot of the work that I do at the moment. So I think the biggest challenge and actually the biggest piece of work I'm currently doing is actually making people aware we exist. Because in an organization of fifteen thousand with a team of, I think across the business we've got. I think there's about eight people that actually do OD in, and and it's part of their title and it's part of what they do. I think it's about eight or nine. So so we, we it's a very small group. So one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to actually go out to the business and say, hey, you know, do you, do you need help in your teams? We can do this thing and it's called OD and we we're here to help you. Um, so that's that's part of the challenge we have. Because the temptation has always been, well, you know, we don't have this capability. We're engineers. We don't, you know, who does this OD thing? This is where you pay, you know, we need to go pay a lot of money to, you know, insert consultancy name there. Uh, you know, like this mm. is this is this has been the, the temptation in the past, but we've got internal capability. We're trying oh, yeah. to get out there more. Really, and I know Sean has got some views as well in terms of that, that area, and we'll, we'll move on to that. Um, we've just got time. Um, there's some really nice questions coming in. Nicola has asked, what advice would you give to Anna Stuttgart and Hadid? We're going we're to leave that session um, with that question. So Sean and Anne-Marie and Alexis will leave the session uh, as we're ending it, is with their advice about what you would do to actually um, uh, to, to, get, to start your career. Um, Danny, have you got a question from the chat box that we could just ask Alexis before we move on to Sean here? Yeah, one of the questions is, what sort of business problems can you help solve? You talked about kind of getting the the, the, no, the, the um, getting the, the word out about what you do. What sort of business problems can you help your your people solve with OD? So, um, unfortunately, because some of the projects, of, well, the company I work for is extremely private, and some of the projects are extremely, like, I I, I don't know how much I can say, but let's just say. So I'm currently working on a big OD piece or a project. Uh, can't say where, but it's to do with the Ministry of Defense, and it's to help with a secure thing that they're doing. They have very tight timeline for what they're trying to achieve. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have to be cryptic just because the nature of the work is that sensitive. But they've got very, very tight timelines, and one of the key things that the project recognised that's going to help them get it over the line is making sure people's behaviors are aligned. So there's a real tangible case where if we don't help them do what they're going to do, they're not going to achieve something that could have a detrimental effect for, for the country. I know that sounds a little bit dramatic, but, you know, it, th these are just some of the things that, that we help the business do. We help, you know, we're, 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 we're at a stage where we're actually providing value. We're actually almost selling our service even to our clients. You know, that project in Serbia that I work on, when they call me and they bring me over, they're, they're paying for me. I'm making money for my organization by bringing OD. So, yeah, there's, it's, 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 you, can, you can add as much value to the business as you want. It's just up to you. It's for you to own it and show that value. And I think that's always a tricky one for, for OD in general. How do we show that value? Brilliant. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a whole range of questions, so you're free to get stuck into the chat box. Um, there's been some specific questions asked of you, so feel free to, to dive in there and ask them as well. Um, we're going to move on to Shauna now, if that's OK. Um, so, Shauna, um, I'm just going to de-spotlight Alexis, and I'm going to spotlight Shauna. So, so welcome, Shauna. Um, brilliant. So, um, just for everyone, uh, You've got an enormous role, but what, what does your role actually involve, please? A million dollar question. Um, <clears throat> so um, I lead um, an organisational design and development directorate that is set within the organisation. Um, so my role is twofold, I suppose. So um, first of all, I've got the leadership element of my role. So I need to set direction for a team of around 50, which includes some um, organizational design people, um, organizational development, um, engagement, 
cultural uh, change agents. Um, so there's that whole breadth um, and within that team as well, we're also the, the safeguard or guardian of the values of the organisation. Um, and then the other part of my role um, is I am the subject matter expert for the executive team and the board to advise um, them and also directors on how organisational design and development could be best used to help move the organisation forward. So we have a, uh, as many organisations do, I'm sure, um, we have an extensive strategy that sets out what HMRC is going to achieve by 2030. Um, a lot of that is, uh, which you'll be aware of sort of in the public eye, the uh, new systems, the new digital systems that we'll be putting in place, the different tax lines that we might be looking at as part of the the public change and the policy and the ministers come in um, and so my role is to look at that strategic direction and then figure out what needs to change organisationally in order to be able to reach that so whether that be uh, the structures the behaviours the uh, the types of people the capabilities the skills that we have etc I sort of set out that plan and then the, the team delivers it or other elements of HR deliver it. That, that wasn't really very nutshelly. No, no, no. Well, it's, it, it, there, there's so many things I want to unpack in there. And obviously the, the, uh, my task is to sort of really focus on design, but there's one thing I, I have to concentrate on. But, but just give us an idea of the scale and size of, div, of the HMRC, of what you oversee. Uh, so uh, HMRC as an organisation is 70,000 people. So it's uh, so when you're talking about needing to change the culture of 70,000 people for an organisation that's existed for hundreds of years, um, it's... The Titanic, <laughs> maybe not the Titanic. It's an oil tanker. <laughs> really, and that, that actually just there was one thing you said there. Where I thought I can't not ask that. You said you're the guardian of the values. Please, yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. you elaborate so, that a little bit more? Um, so, um, in an ideal world, I'd like to describe that as a, so. Uh, one of my first roles when I joined HMRC about five years ago was to help to develop the values for the organisation so that they could be values led. Um, and so, um, part of that is making sure that the way in which we deliver the values through our customer service function, through the interactions that we have with each other, through the policies and processes that we have in place, um, that they all include the values. Now, sometimes that does translate to people inviting me to a meeting and then going, well, it's all right. We've got Shauna in the room, so the values are ticked off, um, which isn't necessarily always the case. Um, so uh, we do find that quite often you can be the one in the meeting that's going, can we just check that that will still make sure that we're trusted, that we're respected, those kinds of things. Brilliant. And I think if we ask you how you got into OD, that'll, that'll um, sort of explain a lot of people about like, like how, what, what your journey's been like. So how, what was your journey actually to, you know, Deputy Director um, of this role? Um, so I, um, so I sort of, found myself into OD through change management. So a lot of what you described earlier, Garen, about the different roles, et cetera, really did resonate with me. So I know you were looking for us to be um, a little bit more challenging on it, but I just found myself nodding along and thinking, yeah, this, this <laughs> describes it. Um, so um, I, um, well, initially I was actually working um, as a social care worker. So I was doing one-on-one -on -one therapy with individuals based on my psychology background. So, but when I look back on it, that's about individual change. So I was working with people who were struggling to get past a mindset in order to be something else. Um, and I actually found that a very challenging and quite draining role because you could never really do enough for the individual and you'd get pulled into it um, and so from there I stepped sort of into um, a more corporate type role and so I did workforce planning for adult social care so looking at what the workforce needed to be in the future and that's how I sort of got interested in major change management and organisational development so from that role I moved into a, a change consultant role an internal one so that was program management identify changes that needed to happen, build them, push them forward. Um, I then uh, managed the transformation portfolio for a council. Um, and then from there, just sort of stepped into more and more senior roles. Um, so uh, head of transformation, um, head of change management, um, and then assistant director. But that was when I was given an organisational development job title. Um, 
of which I thought, gosh, why are they giving me an organisational development job title? I don't know how to do that. Um, so I had a massive amount of um, imposter syndrome when I was given that job title in particular, because I thought I'm not really an OD person. I'm a change person. Um, and it took me a while, I think, to wear that badge well. I think well that, and that's really interesting because in the in the section that we, we we've got the interviews and imposter syndrome is a really common theme that comes up for a lot of people in their od journey like where am, am i doing od am i good at it and like i see these other people that do od and they just talk in this language that i don't understand you know everything's about um inquiries and sense making and all that what was it that that, that sort of that made you sort of feel that there was an imposter syndrome um, I think exactly that. So people would, so um, sometimes when you meet OD people, it can seem a little bit like there's a secret handshake where they're talking about all these tools and uh, things behind the scenes. And you think, oh my God, I just don't have a brain that retains that level um, of theoretical knowledge. Um, and so I've sort of had to really readdress myself and be like, do I know those things? Have I heard of uh, Berkeley with all those things that you put up at the beginning um, and um, and sort of just re-looking inside myself um, I still to this day when I'm uh, asked by the chief executive to do something and they challenge me on what organisation design is I go away and have to look at Naomi Stanford's book and be like no no I do, I do know organisation design I do know what I'm going to do um, so um, I, I think that it because there are so many different ways to do OD and when OD is done well, it's bringing all of those different ways together that it can make you feel a little bit impostery because you're not the same as the next person, but that's fine because the reason that OD works so well is everybody brings their own approach to it um, because we're all really just focused on changing the system, fixing something and making it better. We've just got different tools to do it. The, the chat box has just blown up at what you just said there. I think that's really struck <laughs> oh, home God. with quite a few people. No, it's good. I think it's a really common theme. I, th I think it's probably something we don't talk about enough because I I've personally went through it and some and still have it today. You know, sometimes you just take on these assignments and you're like, oh my gosh. Um, so uh, it's completely relatable. Um, and you you've your develop your journey was quite interesting. Obviously, we've got about about five minutes left. So I just want to just sort of maybe pick through these a little bit quicker. So, um, what kind of professional development have you completed? You actually were very fortunate with some of the people you've worked alongside. You've worked alongside consultancies, haven't you? And you've worked actually alongside Naomi Stanford as well. Yeah, yeah. So I've done um, I've done a whole bunch of formal qualifications. So I've obviously got my master's in occupational psychology. Um, I've got program management qualifications. Uh, the psychometric assessments loads of that stuff but actually where I feel like I have learned the the most is by working alongside different consultants like uh, Deloitte, PwC, Q5 um, and seeing how they approach different things and learning from them so not necessarily um, you know there are some consultants that have really fixed models for how they're going to do something and I don't necessarily mean that it's the way in which they work the way that they do stakeholder management in a, especially um, has really helped like bring my practice on I think um, and then just getting to work with people like Naomi Stanford um, has been amazing because she just asks the most insightful questions and gives like the best advice I'm very, very lucky to sort of come across her since I moved into civil service. Yeah, there, there was something I, I heard her sort of say, and it's um, it, it's kind of being comfortable with not knowing was really useful. She sort of said she proposed three different organisation designs to a client, and the client said, which one's the best? And she said, all of them. <laughs> she doesn't, you don't know until you test them, do you? And it's kind of that comfort with not knowing. Do, do you find yourself yeah. in that situation much when you're trying to do an organisation for, you know, an enormous part of the organisation? Oh, definitely. There's, there is no, there is no right answer uh, with OD. And I think being really comfortable with that and getting to the place where your client feels most comfortable with what they want to do, because often they'll have something in their head, but they're not brave enough to say it um, because they want to see all the science and the theory, etc., that sits behind it. And so I think really being able to ask your client the questions and get underneath it um, often leads to the best solution um, and helping them to step through it. Um, I think that's why uh, I think that's why OD speaks to the psychologist in me because it's really just about getting to know people um, and asking questions a lot of the time. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and what do you enjoy most about your role and what do you find most challenging? Uh, so I love that uh, no two days are ever the same. Um, so uh, 
even if somebody presents you with what seems to be the exact same problem, it never is the exact same problem. There's always something different that's going on behind it. And that is dead interesting. Um, and I think what the biggest challenge is, is having to constantly define what OD is. Um, I think I must have gone through it, especially running an internal service and team of OD, um, because actually the organisation wants OD to be everything. And so you're sort of stepping on people's toes a little bit. Um, and so there isn't a niche box that you fit into. And that can be quite hard when you're in an organisation, especially when you're trying to motivate a team of people as well to see the value that they have. Brilliant. Um, Danny, we're going to just switch to a couple of chat questions in a moment, if that's OK. Um, there was one thing sorry, just I thought it was really useful, actually, about um, when we were doing the sort of preparation uh, chats. Um, there was something that you said about um, when OD should get involved. And you're saying you gave a really great definition of if it's a knotty problem. Can you remember what you said there? Oh, I told you I wouldn't remember what anything <laughs> that we'd said on that call at all, and you would just have to play it back to me. Um, so um, I think so. So when I find that we are commissioned most often in the organisation at the moment is they go, oh god, I've got a really nutty problem, and I can't figure out how to fix it, or we'll just give it to OD. <laughs> you just suddenly get handed this random whale of a problem um, that you then have to think about and resolve because actually it will have about six things that are going on that you need to look at and fix as part of the system it's never just the one thing so um i think one of my team pulled together like different examples of um uh of the problems that we get given and one of the problems that we were given last week let me find it was oh our customer experience mm -hmm. scores don't seem to be particularly no, 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 no. can you do something to fix that please od and it's a bit like oh it's your customer experience scores, like, <laughs> why, why is it suddenly our problem to fix it? So it's quite random things like that that get uh, presented forward, but it's never just a little problem. It's always like this massive, like customer experience. That's not just a tiny little fix. Brilliant. And, and Karen Domain, one of our contributors that we really want to sign post you to, she said it's the power of curiosity and good questions, always like the, the best tool in your uh, <laughs> in your 100%. toolkit. Brilliant. Danny, have you got a couple of questions that have come through the chat box? It's been a really lively chat box. It has so been a really lively chat. Yeah. So one of the questions we've got is what are your tested ways of selling your services or expertise to decision makers? Ooh, good question. Oh, oh it is. Um, so, um, so I think my team often say like, um, Sean, just send Shauna because she'll be able to sell the snow to the Eskimos. Um, I think <laughs> um, I just really listen to what the client's telling me is the issue. And then I sell OD as whatever they're wanting to hear that the solution is, which probably doesn't help with the identity thing that my team have, because I sell us in through every different route uh, possible. Um, but I think that's because that's the multifaceted role of OD. And so I think if you try and talk to a client in OD speak about, you know, so we can help you to achieve your strategy, what does that actually mean? Because at the point that they come to OD to ask for help, they're often at their wits end, having tried lots of different things. And so at that point, they want to hear something practical and tangible. Um, and so that's what I do. So I often uh, say to clients, right, so I hear the problem that you're experiencing is this. So what we can do is X, Y, Z. So and immediately put it into really practical, tactical OD things that we're going to do. Right. I hope that's answered the question yeah, with a really good question. Practical and tactical, we like that. Um, and Danny, we've got time for one last question before we switch to, to Anne-Marie. And bear in mind, everyone, um, at around about 10 past, quarter past seven, we're going to have a Q&A and a bit more of a panel chat. And the, the panellists have a chance to talk to each other and reply to all the different things they've heard of each other. They've all been nodding curiously as well. So uh, keep keep the questions coming. A really good chat box tonight. Um, Danny, we've got one more question for Shauna, please. Yeah, one, one more question about the being comfortable with not knowing. So this person says, how do you blend this from a kind of from a traditional kind of HR people professional kind of who like def definite outcomes? And how do you how do you blend that really? Um, so how do you blend not knowing with people who like to find outcomes? Yes. Is that the question? Yeah. Because uh, that's not what the client wants to hear, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. So so often we give an example. So um and I always give an example of where something presented as A, but then turned out to be B, so that they can get comfortable with this is going to unearth more things than you think. Um, and so um, 
I often say, uh, and I also talk about the bespoke nature of the work that the team does. So I play up on, we're not just going to give you a toolkit that's just going to fix this for you. Um, we're, I'm going to give you a practitioner that's going to work alongside you, observe your team, observe the day to day, because the solution that we give for you is going to be for you, not just for any team that can roll it out. And so I sort of really play on that whole bespoke, we love you type angle. Brilliant. That that really talks to probably one of the most underappreciated but most important elements of OD, which is the contracting process, like expectations management. And, and that bit is critical, isn't it? As you're trying to sort of manage their expectations, help them have an appreciation of what it looks like and how we'll work together as well, because it's a, it's a new way of working often, isn't it? Yeah, ex contracting and then recontracting. So quite often in the commissioning uh, conversations that we're having as a team, we will talk about you need to go back now and recontract that we you know we cannot continue going down this pathway because the client is expecting something completely different um, and i think you should expect to recontract at least three times when you're in the, when you're going through an od process um, because it, as the problem evolves and the foundations of the issue becomes clearer you are going to need to recontract and the expectation really um, it's like you were saying at the beginning, Garen, you know, OD is that temporary scaffolding that's put around the team. At the end of the day, it's not, we can't fix it for somebody. The team or the manager or the particular area of the organisation is going to hold the fix. And so they can get quite swept up in just letting the OD consultant hold it from the beginning bit whilst the um, investigation, discovery, that's the word, is found out. And so I think they can get quite comfortable with just leaving you to hold it uh, rather than them wanting to own it. And so definitely there is always a final recontracting, which is about now this is your role. This is what you will continue to do. If, if, if you take anything away from <laughs> what you want to talk about, drill that into your practice. It's so important, isn't it? <laughs> so that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate it. Um, if you want to go back, if you're, uh, you're on an iPad, so you probably won't be able to go into the chat, but feel free to read those. I've logged on on my phone, so I will see if I can go in and start responding to some questions in there. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to just switch you off spotlight, if that's OK. And now we're going to move over to Anne-Marie, who's been waiting incredibly patiently throughout. And we're really looking forward to hearing from Anne-Marie and the perspective that she brings, because she does the thing that when when internal consultants are finding it really difficult, she's doing the dream, which is the ability to move and work with different organisations as well. So, um, so Anne-Marie's going to sort of share her journey. So uh, Anne-Marie, could you just share um, just what does your role involve as, as a director of energize yeah so um i started energize in uh, i think was it 2020 the pandemic happened whatever year the <laughs> pandemic happened i decided to start my own business which was just crazy um so what does it involve i started to write this down and i thought it might just be easier just to explain a bit of like a week in a week in the life of me mm, so um cool. it's just me me and my small business um and so in the last week i have been running some um so i ran a large group event last week for 200 people People who are about to go into a they're going to merge as um, one organization uh, in April so that was the first time all of those people had come together and there was lots of anxiety in the room lots of sizing each other up and concerns about what the future looked like so we did lots of work around some of that stuff um, I then had my uh, Q1 mentoring session so I, I pay for some business mentoring because business is not really you know something that I learned in local government in terms of running your own business. Um, I've been doing some executive coaching and I've also been working on a marketing strategy for a course that I'm launching so very varied. There's a lot of variety there is it is it the variety that kind of drew you to it or is it even more variety than you anticipated? Um, it's, to do that. Oh, that's my iPad. Sorry. Um, so, uh, and I'll come to this in a sec. So, I, I nothing drew me to being self-employed because I didn't want to be self-employed. Um, but what absolutely keeps me here is the variety and the autonomy. So, I love being able to get to know different businesses and how um, different kind of functions within those businesses work, but also the variety I have in my week where I can do stuff with my business, I can do some personal development stuff, but I can also do some really big interventions and small interventions and feel like I'm making a difference in all of that. 
Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, almost like with Sean, like when, when you describe your journey, that really makes sense about how w where you are today. So how, how did you actually get into OD? You know, um, was it you like from, from the age of three, you dreamt of being an OD practitioner? Absolutely. Or was, it something, <laughs> or was it something that found you or you found it? Um, so my first job was work, walking donkeys up and down the beach. So it didn't start there, but that was a really cool job. Um, so I'm quite similar to Shauna. So um, I was a housing benefits officer for quite a few years. So um, my job was to help assess people's eligibility um, for help with their rent and their council tax. Um, and also work with other agencies to help support some of those more vulnerable people. So it was a very different role. And I hadn't really worked in a corporate environment in terms of, you know, HR or anything like that before. Um, and to fast forward, basically, um, I was working in a tri-council partnership and we had a brand new chief executive come in and he was really different. Um, and he decided that he wanted a transformation program. And I'd never worked anywhere that had anything like that before. Um, but I was an employee that felt really passionate about things. And um, so much so I became a trade union rep because I felt like I really wanted to help improve things for people and, and make sure you know, things didn't go under the radar and stuff. So I knew I was attracted to organisational change, but I didn't really know that jobs existed in organisational change. So um, I was walking down the corridor one day and we, because we were going through a big um, uh, merger, a we had permanent trade union rep who was, you know, on the book sort of thing. And he said, oh, Anne-Marie, why don't you apply for one of these secondments in the change team? I said, well, I don't have any qualifications as a project manager. And he said, no, just go and do it. Go and, go and apply. So I applied for a project officer role and got it. And then I just found that I was doing something I really loved. Um, and I really loved it because I noticed that I was being put on all the projects that people didn't want to do because they were with they were gritty people projects, basically, that um, meant that you had to really kind of think about how you approach something, really think about your stakeholders, tread carefully. Um, and I was so used to that with my kind of customer experience roles and working with people that are at the most kind of challenging times of their lives. You know, I've got no money to pay the rent. It's a really challenging time. So ended up um, doing that for a while and heading up that team. And then we went to a unitary council. So that's like a mega council. And not very often in local government do you get to start from scratch. Um, and so I was lucky that I um, was offered a secondment uh, to cover um, some maternity cover as head of organisational development um, in this brand new council. But it meant that no one had done this role before. And really importantly, this was to replace a head of HR role. So we'd gone from quite a traditional HR function to we're not even going to have, have a head of HR anymore. We're going to have head of OD and you're going to have someone that's never worked in HR before um, and that you know I'll be really honest that was with mixed feelings I didn't get necessarily a great reception to start with um, but yeah so I ended up as head of OD in a brand new council and then when that maternity cover came to an end I thought I'm loving this and I want to keep doing it um, and so I had a conversation with my chief exec and said look can I take the redundancy that's on offer to me and I'm going to go and try and do it and make it on my own. And uh, yeah, I've survived three years. Wow, what a journey. So yes, brilliant. Well, there's so much to unpack in there. I guess, um, like, what, what do you actually do for your professional development and what kind of sort of things have you, have you, have you picked up along the way? Yes. So I'll be really open and honest. I had a really, um, my most imposter feeling, I guess, has been around not having a CIPD qualification because that was one of the things that kind of came as like really strong feedback when I got this role was she doesn't even have a CIPD. Um, and so I did really struggle with that. So I started my CIPD qualification and, and really enjoyed it. But what I was struggling with was when you're running your own business, and studying at the same time, I was having to make the tough decision between study time and paid work. And I had to take the paid work stuff. So um, I started my qualification last year, year before. I've got two modules from that. So I've done the seven ODD and seven ERM. Um, but I think what I really need to do is do my experience assessment because I think that's probably going to be more time effective for me. Um, yeah. And then in terms of other bits of professional development, um, I really, it came up in the chat and I really just wanted to kind of scream this out loud because um, I talk about it in my um, 
internal consultancy program is, you know, it's really great to have tools and models, but I think sometimes we can use them as a bit of a mask and we can kind of over rely on them for us to feel credible. And that, you know, a really experienced practitioner is someone that can walk into a room and hold whatever's going on there and try and do something with it. And I think I made the mistake that I, I was like, I need to pick up any tool. I need to learn all the models. I, you know, I need to do everything to make me feel real when actually the real work is a balance of that and also me developing my my own kind of confidence and and understanding me and how I show up and influence the people that I work with. Yeah, that's that's really insightful, isn't it? And and the thing, the term you'll always hear in OD is um, self as instrument, isn't it? Yes. The, um, there's lots of nods going on from Sean and Alexis as well as we're saying that. Um, it's it's just one of those classic phrases. Do you mind if I ask for for people mm. what does self as instrument mean to you? Like, to me, yeah, yeah. So um, it's doing work on me, and so me taking time out for a mentoring session or coaching supervision or um having you know getting some feedback on the work that I've done that's that's how I know how I influence something so me going to do that 200 person thing last week what I really want to do is not ask for feedback in case they say they don't love me and then I'll feel awful but in reality what I need to do is better understand how I've shown up to those people how they've experienced me and how I've influenced Mm. their experience of the day so to me it's how I show up and the work that I do on myself yeah, because it's hard, isn't it? Because when you're doing change, you're always trying to think, well, what's my stuff? And what's what's their stuff that's going yeah. on from the change as well? Brilliant. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. And um, the next question I want to ask is, wh- what do you enjoy most about your role or find most challenging? Mm, um, I love the variety and I love the autonomy. So definitely those two. In terms of challenging, um, so if I think back to my public sector days, And I'm sure that Shauna will have experienced this too. We've had lots of consultants come in that have charged lots of money and not really done very much. And I've never wanted to be one of those. And so what I struggle with is when I do a piece of work with a client is I don't always get to see the very, very end result. You know, as when you're an internal practitioner, you stay with that work, even if you're not in it anymore, you get to see it play out. So I I kind of miss that satisfaction of, after you've delivered the product or the intervention and you're contracting out, I never get to see in three years time, what does that look like now? Or even in six months time, what does it look like now? Well, what's some of the work you're most proud of? Like, What's really stood out for you? <clears throat> I really like the stuff that I do with OD teams or people. So what I've really noticed, and I've been guilty of this too, is that we might do a restructure yeah. and we suddenly change a H- HR person's job title to involve the world consultant but we don't really help that person or the organization to understand an internal consultancy model. So I really love the work that I've done either as an interim or through, you know, my internal consultancy skills program is to help people develop confidence as consultants working within an organization and really thinking about that whole OD consultancy cycle and how to contract effectively, diagnose, you know, do the work, evaluate, contract out. I think organizations aren't really set up to work in that way, particularly when you're internal. So I I love that kind of stuff because I've been there and I've also managed those teams and I've also been someone that's contracted someone to come in and do that stuff. So I guess that's a nice round circle for me, that kind of work. Brilliant. I'm going to give you a quick follow-up question to that because I think that's really intriguing, isn't it, as being like that transition, like how do you go from um, like someone with sort of a set responsibilities to actually being an internal consultant? Um, And Sean and Alexis, in a few moments we're going to do it, so if you've got any observations or things that come to your mind as as all of you have been talking tonight, it'd be really interesting to to hear that. But but Anne-Marie, so so what does it take to actually sort of transition to being like an internal consultant when you have had a sort of a, a more traditional role? I think um, it's really important to set to to kind of reset with the organization and not just just not just kind of confirm job titles and structure, but to really think about how do we want this to feel differently to, you know, to, to the rest of the organization, but also what does the organization need from us? You know, let's not just assume it's the same, but badge differently. What's what will be different if we have an internal consultancy model and, you know, what will stop 
those people looking elsewhere and buying in people like me now to come and do it because we're not, they don't know about us or we're not doing it effectively. Let's get that stuff out now rather than wait for them to go and commission someone else to do it. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Oh my God, we, we are dead on time. So guys, um, I've just been so impressed with um, uh, uh, all the questions that have come in so far. And thank you so much to Sean and Alexis for, for, Emily, for your brilliant insights. Um, I guess we, we, just for the next 15 minutes, we're going to invite people in to ask questions, but um, uh, Sean and Alexis and also Anne-Marie as well. Um, what kind of reflections have, have you had as you've been he hearing each other's examples and journeys? Any sort of similarities or things that have emerged for you? Yep, go for it, Shona. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, I, I'm really struck by um, the the different but similar um, routes that we've had. So we've all sort of started off in different places, but actually the kind of innate things that we've been talking about that really interest us um, are really similar. Um, and that that's really struck a chord with me because I've always sort of had this um, unspoken belief, I suppose, that um, OD is an innate kind of skill that people have. So I think if you um, are really, you know, if you can look at a problem and you see the different things that are behind it, or if actually you're always thinking about things on a wider system scale, then OD is probably for you. You just don't realise it because we don't really put the OD, OD label to a lot of things. Um, and so that's kind of what's really struck me listening to the, the different reflections that we've had on sort of our, our pathways to where we've got to. Brilliant. And, and and just picking up one of the things that Anne-Marie talked about, which is, you know, um, people, because it is about how to get into OD. Um, and obviously, you know, there, there's people, you, there, there's real and sort of perceived barriers as well. And, and Shona, when we, I'm going to remind you again of our conversation, but when you were sort of saying, you said that the best OD person that you've, one of the best OD people you've ever worked with, didn't necessarily have an OD background and didn't think of themselves an OD, but they had an innate ability to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, sh she similarly came from a local government background so she was a community manager so she worked with communities around the different issues that they had um and when i spoke with her she's like oh my god this woman is amazing she has to come and work in my team she's brilliant um and it didn't matter how many times i told her that she just did not believe that she was an od person so she really felt like she was missing having the badge so really similar to you, Anne-Marie, like, oh, but CIPD haven't said that I do OD, so <laughs> I can't possibly be doing it. Um, and so she's gone and done um, a few courses, including like, you know, Roffey Parks and stuff with Ashridge um, and sort of done those and then left it and gone, do you know what? I've been doing OD. <laughs> it's like, yes, <laughs> yes, you have, absolutely. Um, so I think doing some of those taught things can just reaffirm um, and help you to understand that what you've been doing in practice, which just felt like a natural thing to you, mm. actually has a label or a theory or a model that you can put to it. Um, but she was doing it all along. She just didn't know that it was called McKinsey's 7S. Or <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's great. And, and, and Danny, we'll just switch to some questions. The, um, the guy's been working really hard in the chat box, uh, but some of those questions have been really good. So I think we can re-ask them to the, to the, to the panel. Um, Anne-Marie and Alexis, anything that stood out for you guys as have been going through people's different experiences? I think the same, that, that we all have that moment where we've gone, oh, it's so OD, is that the thing that we're doing? Yeah, I think that's really stood out to me because I kind of, I, I didn't realise other people had those moments too. So that's, that was really nice for me to hear that we ha haven't all just grown up knowing we're going to do OD. Brilliant. And for you, Alexis, any thoughts there? Oh, I, I, I don't think I need to add anything else. I think Sean and Anne-Marie have pretty much hit the nail on the head. Um, but one thing that did come to my mind, so actually literally today we got a new OD specialist that joined our team in the Middle East. He has a doctorate in OD. He's you know, he's got really advanced. He's, he's, he's worked with Bill Brendel. So if anyone, if anyone in the OD world knows, Bill Brendel is like one of the guys in the US. He leads on OD network. He, 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 he does amazing stuff. And he actually co-advised this person's PhD, you know, so, so, so I, of course, I was extremely intimidated because I've never, you know, I've never, you know, I don't have a PhD, let alone a PhD in OD. You know, so and, and when I met with him today, it was actually the complete opposite. He's like, oh, I can't wait to work with you, you know, because <laughs> all the stuff that I have is all theory and stuff. I've never had to apply any of this stuff. You know, this is, uh, you know, I've been learning about 
I've been spending the last few years learning about this stuff, but you've been actually doing it. You know, so that was a real reminder. That was a good moment where my inner critic uh, was able to shut up really quickly because actually, okay, you know, I might not have the, the fancy accreditation and the fancy things that, that go with all those things, but, you know, yeah, and it's that, that doesn't matter. That, yeah, no. yeah, absolutely. That that listening, that inner voice, and challenging it as well. Um, da Danny, any any questions in the chat box that you wanted to share with it for the for the panel? Yeah, there's been a few along a similar theme, and Nicholas summed it up really nicely. It's about how you position yourself uh, as OD internally. So particularly when you've got a dedicate, maybe a dedicated culture team or um, D and I team, how do you position yourself? And somebody else asked, "What's your elevator pitch?" So I'm, I'm happy to jump in there because obviously yeah. mine is a, probably a little bit easier because I don't have my biggest challenge isn't that there are other people that do what I do. It's that they don't realize what I actually do. The easiest way that I've found to explain what I do, um, especially because our organization is all about projects, you know, we get, you know, we get, we get, we get told, hey, we need you to go build a, uh, a $10 billion uh uh, you know, study from scratch. You know, th these are the sort of things that our people go in. So the way I explain what I do, I I can do for your teams what your teams do for the customer. I come to try and help with the problem. The only difference is your teams are doing it from, you know, whether it's engineering, finance, legal, project, you know, whatever their their team does, I do it from the people side. That's the way I normally position it, and that usually tends to land pretty well. Brilliant, thank you, Shauna. Any thoughts? Like, oh, your team hold you up as the <laughs> you could say ice to Eskimos. What 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 would be your sort of uh, sort of positioning? Um, so um, I think I position it like how I how I said at the beginning of this session. So um, if you've got a vision that you want to achieve, um we can help you figure out the pieces that you need to move in order to get there. So um, if you're having trouble putting that into what the picture on the box looks like, we can help you with that too. But ultimately, this is about how we get all of your people and your work really singing from the same hymn sheet so that you get the best business outcomes that you want. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Danny, any other questions in the chat box that would be really useful for me to have? There, there, there's a quote about Bill Brendel, which we'll, we'll quote, we'll reference uh, yeah. properly as well in a moment. Yeah. Uh, what tips have you got from somebody who wants to move from a generalist HR position into an OD role? I'm happy to take that one. Thanks, Emery. Um, I would say volunteer for some projects or some kind of corporate things that are going on that would give you exposure to change or, um, you know, as I've called it, kind of gritty stakeholder stuff. Because I think if you can do challenging stakeholder stuff, you can do OD, you know, because I think it's people and people going through change and when people are, you know, most kind of at their under pressuredness so um yeah i would i would try and find some projects that you can work on that's outside of your kind of official job description brilliant and um if you go in there i think liz child's experience she started out as an hr business partner and then has made the transition over so feel free to we'll, and again we'll reference that slide again um, and that'll be in a slide deck that you'll see with the cipd shortly um danny there's just one question that i saw earlier from Anne wait about and this probably for Anne marie is is any tips for getting myself in front of clients who will, who will invest in od the are they are they as explicit as do they actually ask for od from you like how would you know when no. or how would they know that they want OD? No, and that's what's really hard for me is because I talk about stuff as OD, but when people come to me, they're not asking for OD. So I find because my world of OD is very much focused on change, it's normally people that are what I would love is people came to me when they're planning some change activity and they want to do it really well. But in reality, what happens is when it's not going so well, they want to find out why. Um, so I think I try and talk about it in the language that I've experienced, i.e. you've got a project and you've got a people related change project that's not going so well and you want some help. One of the other things that's um, been a nice way to kind of help people understand that stuff is to talk about change readiness. So to talk about it in a language that is about, I guess, um, productivity, you know, this is about you being ready for change rather than fluffy because they don't really want the fluffy stuff. 
Um, or when you know when we talked about McKinsey 7S earlier, that that can feel like quite a nice strategic tool rather than it be about let's get everyone in the room and hug, you know, because because they don't really want. That's what they sometimes COD as, and we have to kind of show that there's lots of science and theory behind it that is you know helps with its credibility. But yeah, does OD have a PR issue? Do you think? Yeah. And I don't think we help ourselves. You know, I talked about in the chat, like we're quite, we, it's quite medical, you know, I'm a practitioner. I diagnose, it can feel quite, yeah, you could, you, you could, yeah. I don't think we help. Yeah. Um, Shauna and Alexis, you're nodding there as well. Do you, do you agree that maybe OD doesn't have as, oh, sorry, Alexis, jump in there, please. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, 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 it's actually, um, it's actually, scary how, how how much we can end up uh we, we're almost our, our own worst enemy and it's probably of the virtue of the fact that we're so you know by nature you know we're supposed to be very flexible very emergent and you know it's very easy for for us to almost sh shoot ourselves in the foot in a way brilliant thank you um and danny do we, we have we're going to move into the advice section now so um, we've had loads of people requesting advice and we wanted to leave it to the end to give everyone something to think about so uh, Anne marie and alexis and sean if you want to just think about the advice you'd give for someone wanting to get into od from wherever you begin um danny any final questions for um, for people to, to tackle no i think if we get into that that question that's the one people lots of people are asking how do i get into od what tips okay. have, hints have you got Let's make some time for that, shall we? So, we, so we use it for the last uh, to last five minutes. So, uh, let's go. Um, who'd like to go first? Let's go, uh, Alexis. Are you okay to go first? This. So, what advice would you have? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one, I guess. Listen, for me to get into OD explicitly in the UK, it it took it took a big leap of faith from the deputy director of OD at. University Hospitals of Leicester, I'm happy to call her out, Bina Katecha, she was amazing. She actually created that role and she, she, you know, she took that leap of faith. And I think any any OD practitioner that hasn't cut their teeth, in at least for those who practice in the UK, I don't want to presume everyone here is from the UK, but for those who are practicing OD in the UK, if you haven't cut your teeth in, in the NHS and the public sector in some form or another, you are losing out on learning how to basically make magic from almost nothing. Because you're expected in, in the NHS, at least in the public sector, you're expected to basically make miracles. You have to be able to do team alignment sessions, you know, team development sessions with like no budget. You're expected to make, you know, you're supposed to use a facility that's basically derelict and somehow make it a room that's, that's gonna create this magic. And I think that's, that's definitely a big one. And I think look for those opportunities internally. You know, Anne Marie made that great point about look for those volunteer opportunities within your own organization to build that skill set. You know, I think that's certainly a big one. And the right. final thing I'll say is just look for look for look for the networks and, and, and look for those opportunities to, to learn from other people out there. Yeah, the OD community is very generous and, and everyone pays it forward in their own way. And and, and most people will mentor or spend time with others that are on the way up as well. Um, Anne-Marie, how, how, what tips would you like to sort of share with budding OD people? Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think my biggest lesson learned is not to over invest in the specialisms. You know, don't feed that imposter by thinking the next psychometric tool is going to make me a real OD practitioner. I think you you know HR in itself you will have experience in OD because of the work that you do so you're already doing this stuff if you want to really specialize perhaps think about you know what am I most most attracted to is it org design is it org development is it a bit of both you know maybe and do a bit of reading about those things um I'm always happy to chat to people I'm sure my colleagues here are too if anybody wants to kind of ask specific things but I think when it comes to transitioning um do some do with some of that use of self stuff so um in the uh me Anne's website I can't think equality and quality is that right Garen yeah. um there's a really good research report um that kind of talks about all the different um 
characteristics that make up OD practitioners, according to lots of research reports that have been put together. So that can be a really nice starting point to kind of see where your strengths lie and where you'd like to develop. And that can perhaps, you know, narrow, narrow where your focus. Brilliant. Great tips. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Um, and Shauna, um, you've had the most amount of time to think of advice. So what, what, what are your thoughts there? It's got no better. I think it's going to be the same. Um, so, so I think um, if you are already working in um, like a HR role, um, which is most more relevant for this session. So um, think about the things that you've done that have focused on um, a problem solving element or when you've had to look at something and seen a pattern. So sickness trends, you know, all of all of those kinds of things are really relevant. Um, and then you have stepped in to support the manager and helped them put in place two to three different interventions in order to make that fix. You have done OD, you have got an example of doing OD. Um, and so I think if you look into the different activities that you've been doing, you might have some examples that you can use there to step over into an OD role. If you're really looking and thinking, you know, my my HR role has really been quite focused. I just do this one thing. Then start looking at some of those other connecting roles. So um, change, continuous improvement, um, a HR strategy role, uh, HR policy role, uh, an L&D role, workforce planning. They can all be stepping stones into OD um, and actually might be quite useful because I think sometimes um, when HRBPs in particular have moved into my team because they want more OD experience, um, sometimes they get a bit freaked out quite quickly because it's like I was dealing with this little problem that the manager had to now I've got an organisational problem and there are 9,000 managers that have got this same issue. So what am I going to do about that? Um, and so be kind to yourself about rather than just jumping in, think about what are the skills that you want in order to move across. Brilliant. Um, guys, I can't thank you enough. I think um, probably one of the things that um, people don't realise is the amount of preparation that was required of the guests. Um, you've all given your time freely um, and I hope you've all found value um, in the participants today. Um, the questions have been a brilliant reflection. So there seems to be a lot of energy around organisation development and design. Um, and we really do wish you the best of luck. Um, Anne-Marie, Alexis and Sean also said that they're really happy for you to contact them via LinkedIn. Um, so if you want to connect with them and if you've got any questions or if you want to be signposted or any reference, and the same goes for me and Danny as well. Um, we really want to bring OD right into the middle because when OD has a place in organisations, it is absolutely transformational. Um, but the problem is that not enough people know about OD. Um, so please go out and speak to as many people as you can about OD. Be curious and find loads of resources. Um, on the slides, we'll, we'll give you a reference to that um, resource section that we've got. We see lots of experiences of other people. Um, the next CIPD session coming up is going to be on March the 14th and the advert that you can sign up for um, is going to be coming out on the our event bright site very shortly so guys um thank you so much for your time have a wonderful evening and uh, we'll see you again soon at the next cipd central london event so thank you